So we have a Game Boy Original here that has a symptom of no sound. This has just been ascending to be repaired live. So let's just take a quick look at this and make sure we don't have any sound first. Let's just validate that we do have the problem that is mentioned. And then we'll get into diagnosing and repairing this Game Boy using an oscilloscope. So an oscilloscope is a very useful tool to actually see what you're doing in hardware and diagnose uh, problems. So you can see it booting there and as confirmed there's no audio. Now we could try the obvious, we could just start connecting headphones and looking at the board and things. But what I want to do this time is to show you how you actually see with an oscilloscope where the problem lies. So instead of finding it by simply looking around for obvious problems or testing with other functions, I want to show you how you use an oscilloscope to find problems. You can pretty much find any problem with an oscilloscope. Between an oscilloscope and a logic analyzer and a multimeter, you have all the tools in your arsenal to be able to diagnose and fix things. So let's take this apart now and take a look at how we find the problem. Before we do that though, I'm going to give you a good overview because we have schematics for this board, which means we can take a look at how if we just disconnect this. We can take a look at how all this board functions. So even the insides, if I just uh, take the game out. And here is a CPU that is actually directly connected to the board, so it doesn't have a die package, so we can't probe as easy, but we can still diagnose this. But we have the schematic for this board, which means we can find out where all these components are, what they connect to, what they're meant to do. So I'm going to give you an overview of the schematic of this board, where I feel we should be looking when we diagnose this problem, and how we, you know, what signals we're expected to see, things like that. So let me just jump into the technical side, and then we'll come back to the bench. So this board has an issue saying there is no sound. Now we could easily fix this by looking under the scope, testing for some obvious things, and doing a physical repair. This time I want to show you how I would solve the problem by looking at the board and actually analyzing what's going on and finding the problem using tools. In this case, we're gonna use a scope and a multimeter. And I want to see the problem before fixing the problem. To show you guys how you can solve any problem on a repair. If you have a schematic like we do here, it's really useful to use. Uh, you don't have to have schematics, but between schematics and an existing working board that you can compare to, you can fix almost any hardware with no knowledge. So in this case, let's just take a look at the GBO schematic. We have two here. We have the original schematics, um, where you can find online, and then we have a board retrace here. And this is something I'll also be doing in open sourcing myself, so you guys can all benefit from files like this and getting board views. Uh, but for now, these are the files we have, and we're just going to use them to assist. So we can see here, this is the CPU, the main chip on the board. If we jump to the board, that'll be this chip here. And the pins we're interested in quite clearly are all out and R out. We know this from simply looking. Uh, so you'll generally look at a schematic and flick through the pages and find what you're looking for. So don't worry too much about what it is and understanding it, but you can tell here this says LCD display. There's nothing on here that looks like sound. And it also tells us down here LCD section. You flick through, it says power and external ROM. So you keep flicking through, generally looking for what you're after. Um, and then we come to here, CPU section, but we'll notice we can see a speaker symbol down here. And then typically all speakers and headphones are paired with an op amp or an amplifier of some kind. So this is the Game Boy amplifier here. So this then leads us to focus our attention on this part of the schematic. So we know the CPUs here. We know we've got pin 59 and 60 that come out. So I would always go back when I'm diagnosing things to first get the board to power up. If the board doesn't power up, look for obviously power rails, ground rails, dead shorts. Getting the, the system booting is a different issue um, than what we're explaining here. But generally you have to get the board booting, making sure something's working. This board loads and displays a screen, I presume, because it's only coming for no audio. So we, we know we have a working board. We can see the game loading, which is a good sign. So we should definitely have audio. So we don't need to concern ourselves with, is the system actually running? Because in this case, we can see that. 
So then we focus our attention on where does the audio first start and just always go back to the starting point. So in this case, it's going to come out of the CPU on pin 59 and 60. So if we look at the retrace, you see this little arrow here, this triangle. This is the indicator of where pin one starts. Typically, most chips these days are standard and they go certain ways. In this case, on the GBO for the CPU, if we want to figure out which way it goes, because pin one could start here and go around like this, or pin one could start here and go around like this. So a quick way to find it is we can see here is the crystal. And if we just zoom in, and if we look underneath the white silk, you can see the trace coming through here, across here, up, and into this pin here. So if we were to go this way, then it would be pin one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If we were to go this way around, it would be near pin 80. It would be near the extreme. So it would be pin 80, 79, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. So it would be pin 72 or 71. So if we just go back here and look for the crystal on the CPU, that's up this top corner. You can see that I've obviously counted roughly there, but it's pin 73 and 74. And there's the crystal. So what that means is these are the high pins here near the end. This is indicating a pin one. So pin one must be here and go pin two, three, four, and go around in an anti-clockwise direction. So now we know where the pins are, we can find pin 59 and 60. So to do that, this is an 80 pin CPU. And if we count them down and across, we have 16 pins in the verticals and we have 24 pins in the horizontals. If we do 24 pins down here, 16 pins up, we get 40 pins. So here's pin 41. So then we want pin 59. So we can go pin 41, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Pin 50 is here. Pin 51, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So these two lines here, pin 59 and 60, which go along here, are the audios. So we would want to start for ease of finding it when we come to the physical board. One, two, three, four, five pins down. So if we come five pins from the left hand side over when we're coming to probe this, pin five and six from that side should be the left and right audio out. So we'd start our investigation there to make sure we've seen a signal. Now the CPU outputs a digital signal for audio. Then it will pass through this capacitor and resistor and then through the volume wheel here. And this will change it to AC signals going into the amplifier. So if we saw no audio coming out of L and R here, it would possibly indicate a bad CPU or the components connected to the board here are bad. So we could have maybe a dead short in the capacitor or something else pulling to ground, uh, which would hamper the signal. So if we don't see a signal here on pin 59 and 60, we would want to remove this capacitor and this resistor, which if we use the traces and followed through and just followed these lines visually, you'll find that we come to these two capacitors here, just below the CPU, which are these two capacitors here. So if we removed these capacitors, there would be nothing between the CPU output and anywhere else on the board. It would just be this wire coming around here coming down and then going to a capacitor pad here that goes nowhere. So if we still didn't see any audio then out of these pins, we have a potential issue with the CPU. All these pins right here are shorted. Uh, so long as we probe directly on the pins, we should see the signal. Now it's very, very rare that you have a CPU with damage. I have seen it before, but it's very rare. So the likelihood is we will get audio out of here. We should see this side of the capacitor, the positive side, having a digital signal and the output on the other side after the resistor seeing an analog signal. It will then go to the volume wheel, which is here. So we could then probe the volume wheel pads. And if we look at a trace of the actual circuit board like this, we can see here pin 59 and 60 coming around, going through, they go into the capacitor positive, out of the negative. So this negative then goes, this blue line underneath, comes back up to the top trace, goes to the resistor here, which goes up to here, and then into the top pin of the volume wheel. So we know, if we follow this backwards, and we go from 
the top of here, up, through and around. Pin 60 comes to the top of the volume wheel. So the top of the volume wheel is the left audio channel. And then the other one, if we looked at this capacitor, comes through the negative, out to here, through this resistor, and the one below it. So in terms of volume wheel, the top two pads, it goes left, then right. That goes into the volume wheel, and then what comes out goes to the amplifier. So we'd expect to see the analog signal going in to the top two pins of the volume wheel. And then we should have the amplifier receiving on pin seven and eight, so basically the outputs. If we look over here, pin seven and eight on the amplifier, come all the way through here, come through there, go underneath, go down and through, up, and to these two pins here. And if we trace the top one, just to see which one it was, pin seven was the top, which we traced to the one below, and pin seven on this volume wheel goes to right out. So what we have is left in, right in, right out, left out in the volume wheel. And then the bottom pad is simply ground. So if we were to probe these pins here, again, we should see the analog input straight from the CPU in these two pins. And these two pins, as we turn the volume wheel, should be a percentage of that signal. So it will reduce in voltage, it will reduce in amplitude. And that's how we turn the volume up and down. If we get a signal into the amp, which I'm semi expecting to get, the most common fault is that this amp has pin six, which goes to the headphone jack, not grounded. So we'll come to that in a moment, but we'd expect to see pin seven and eight of the amp, which if we go over here, pin seven and eight there, so second and third pin on the amp, we'd expect to see the audio signal. So we'd expect to see it coming out of here, pin 59 and 60, get into the caps, go into the volume wheel, and go into pin seven and eight. We can test every one of those points one at a time and see and follow the signal until we find a problem. Presuming we don't find a problem here, my next step would be to make sure the amp has power. So the amp gets power through pin four where it says VCC. So I'd be expecting to find power here. So on the fourth pin from the right, I'd expect to see five volts. That if we trace it, you can see just goes under the amp through this via, up through here, this big red trace, underneath to the blue, which is the bottom side of the board, and back up to here, which is the power switch. So it just gets power directly from the power switch. So I'd expect to see the battery power coming into the amp at pin four. We'd expect to see the audio signal coming in on pins seven and eight. And then now here's where we can split the difference between if there was audio, on say the headphones and not on the speaker, we could isolate the fact that the amplifier must already have the audio coming all the way in and getting into pin seven and eight. And we don't need to even check this side of the circuit because if the amplifier is outputting signal to one of the headphone or the speaker, because the two different parts of the amp, we already know everything before that is fine. Because we have no audio at all at the minute, we can't presume anything. But if we did have audio on one or the other, it eliminates everything we just checked. And instead we could focus on just the output of the amp. There's nothing that fancy on the amp. You've got a few decoupling capacitors here and smoothing caps. Uh, you have an output on pin three going to the speaker with a capacitor going to ground. Now this capacitor here is actually on the front board, not the back. So you won't see this large 100 microfarad on the backboard. But if we check pin three, we should find pin three going to the speaker, which is the connector of the board. So audio input pin seven and eight and pin three here should be the speaker output. So this goes up here through, and it's hard to see here, but there's actually a trace here, this little red line underneath the green that goes to this pad, which you can see here C8. Here's the capacitor going to ground, this big plane here. So this capacitor here by the amp, is this capacitor here going to ground. So again, if we had issues with this line, let's just follow where it goes after that first, comes up here, through, down, onto the other side of the board in blue, and then we can see it goes up, through, under the CPU, makes this wing around, goes around here, 
and goes to pin 20 of the board connector. So if we didn't see output on the speaker, we could also remove this capacitor because it has a potential to do something to the line if it was bad. So we could remove that capacitor and then check if we're getting output on pin three. We're not really concerned about the front board because that's a simple case of driving a speaker. Um, that's a, an easy fix. And if we have the backboard producing audio, we know the problems in the front board and we can look at that. So we check the output of the speaker here. What you would expect to see, depending on the type of amplifier, is simply a higher voltage signal. You can get five volt signals, you can get two volt signals, you can get pulse width modulated signals or analog signals. But the simple fact is, if we have a working board, you can see the signal you'd expect. And once you've done a few audio projects, you'd know what to look for anyway, and if the signal looks right. So I'll show you this working when we find the issue. On top of the speaker output, we should also see the headphone outputs, which is pin 12 and 15. So we take a look at pin 12 and 15. You can see we have pin 15 here going this way and pin 12 going this way. So pin 12 comes down around through to the other side of the board, up through, through to the other side of the board again, all the way up here. And then we have a capacitor here. So if we look at the board, we have a capacitor here. I'm not sure I actually spotted the inductor. Um, but we have this capacitor here, I presume, the 100 microfarad, or no, what we've found actually is the 0 0.047 microfarad capacitors to ground here first. So that'll be one of these two, and that goes to ground. And the signal must go somewhere else because it should be going to the headphone socket. So if we backtrace and see where we've missed, this must split off to somewhere else. So it comes down here, and then here's the point we didn't notice. So see how it comes out of 12? And then this via goes to the other side. There's a blue line coming out, but there's also one coming down this way. So this trace will run all the way down. And it will head all the way down to the headphone socket here on this pin. So we'd expect to see audio on this pin here, which was pin 12. Which in here doesn't really state left or right channel, but either way, one channel is pin 12, the other was pin 15, which will clearly be the other channel coming down here, I would say. But you can just go up and trace where it goes again. Pin 15 will go up, split both ways. One goes up through here, through this capacitor to ground here. And if we come backwards and trace it the other way, it comes through here, down, and it's this outer trace. Comes all the way down and goes to here. So these bottom two pins are again, left and right audio out to the headphone. Then you've got the ground pin here because everything around it's ground, all this big red plane is ground. This remaining pin is the last pin to look at, which is pin six, and it goes to a switch. So when you insert headphones into a headphone jack, there's typically a switch that gets either activated or deactivated. And the other side normally goes to ground or high. So in this case, it goes to ground here. And when the headphones, I believe, and we'll double check, when the headphones aren't in, this switch is connected to ground, which means pin six of the amp is grounded when there are no headphones. When you insert headphones, this switch inside the headphone jack gets raised away from ground and pin six is no longer shorted to ground. This pin six is the indicator for this amp to say whether to play audio on the speaker or not. So when there's headphones inserted, we don't want the speaker playing, which means when headphones are inserted and pin six is not ground, it will mute the speaker. This is a very common problem, and likely the problem of this board, but we'll come to see if it is or not. If this pin isn't grounded when there's no headphones, the amp won't play anything on the speaker because there's no headphones. However, we should still see audio coming out of the headphone jack. So that's really the entire audio system of the Game Boy. You'll find this is very common from the Game Boy to the Color, to the Pocket, to the Advance, to most other systems. They all generally have the same kind of flow. A digital output of audio from a CPU converted to an analog signal passed through a potentiometer for volume control then amplified out. So once you've understood this for the GBO you can pass this knowledge on to most of the boards. So now we've kind of seen what we want to look at, what we want to probe and what we're expecting to see which by the way on the headphones you're expecting to see a voltage signal of about one volt so you'd expect to see a, a sine wave audio signal of about one volt the speaker you'd typically see a bit higher. 
Um, now we've seen that and we know what to check, we'll go and physically do it on this board, check that we do have no audio, turn it off and then diagnose without any speaker or headphones connected, using only an oscilloscope and a multimeter to find the real problem, fix the problem and then turn on and see if we've solved it. So this is more of a hardware diagnostics approach versus a physical hands-on looking at the board for problems. We'll still look at the board for anything obvious like ripped pads, bad vias, things like that, but we want to start with scoping the board to help us find where the problem is.